Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome back to Reimagining Love. My guest today likely needs zero introduction, as she is, as I like to call her, the Beyonce of sex educators. I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Emily Nagoski to Reimagining Love. Dr. Emily Nagoski is the award-winning author of the smash hit New York Times bestselling, Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life, and the Come As You Are workbook. She's also the co-author with her sister, Amelia, of the New York Times bestseller, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Emily has an MS in counseling and a PhD in health behavior, both from Indiana University, with clinical and research training at the Kinsey Institute. And now she combines sex education and stress education to teach women to live with confidence and joy inside their bodies. In Come As You Are, Emily used groundbreaking research to explain the science of and expand our ideas about female sexuality. In the years since the book was published, countless women all over the world have used Come As You Are as a powerful guide to understanding and improving their sexual well-being. And now, in Emily's brand new book, Come Together, The Science and Art of Creating Lasting Sexual Connections, she's turning her lens towards sexual connections in long-term partnerships. In our conversation, Emily gets vulnerable about a roadblock in her own sex life that inspired her to seek insight into how long-term couples maintain sexual connection over time. We uncover the importance of moving away from the shoulds in our sex lives and towards discovering more confidence and joy with our partners. And finally... We respond to a wonderful listener's question about the importance of physical attraction in long-term partnership. Emily's work is essential, it's powerful, it's empowering. I know you're going to take away so many nuggets of wisdom in this conversation. But even more than that, I know that you're going to come away from this episode with a feeling of wholeness and peace inside of you. That is Emily's superpower. Enjoy. Dr. Emily Nagoski, you're back on Reimagining Love, and I am so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) I am so excited to be here. (laughs) Words. Oh, words. Words are good. We love all the words, and we love all the words that you put in your brand new book, which I can't wait to talk to you about. But first... I want to ask you the relational self-awareness question that I ask all the guests of the show. Are you ready for it? Yes. So tell us, please, how are you reimagining love in one of your important relationships these days? Uh, So one of the things that has happened for me recently, well, not that recently, it's been about 15 months now, I had COVID, which turned into long COVID, and I am currently living with physical disability, limitations on my energy and my ability to walk that are brand new. And it's a tricky transition from having always had the privilege of being able-bodied to suddenly at the age of 46, you know, like in March, I couldn't walk to the end of my driveway to get the mail. And though I am getting great care and doing all the things I need to do, and I am getting better every day, one of the things that has become deeply apparent is that 
Uh, you're probably familiar with like spoon theory, the internet sort of language that like when a person lives with a physical disability, any disability, but in my case right now, a physical disability, like you only have a certain amount of energy, a certain number of spoons in a given day. And what I've never heard anyone say in spoon theory is like your relationship, your primary relationship. I'm married. We're child free by choice, but like my marriage is really important to me. Like how many spoons does my marriage take? Yeah. And I'm in the process of like launching a new book. And that's a lot of work. That's a lot of spoons. It is. It is many many of the spoons. The self-care required to do all the stuff for me to heal requires many, many spoons. And I have been experiencing the decision-making of allocating energy to self-care, to work, to my relationship, and recognizing that the spoons I put toward my self-care are also spoons toward my relationship because I have to have enough left in order to be able to connect with him. And the more I take care of myself, the better I get and the sort of more flexible I get with my spoons. But I am having to make different choices now than I did for the previous two books because of these limitations. And the most, the thing that has really revolutionized my life. What I'm deeply reimagining is that my relationship with him is the thing. It's the thing. I mean, the book is about sex and long-term relationships. It's about how I reconnected with him. And the idea of sacrificing that connection, even temporarily for the book, is antithetical to everything that I say in the book. And so I notice myself limiting the choices that I make in order to promote the book so that people can hear about it, which is a cost. And that's how I love my husband. (laughs) It is even as you hold the grief of that, you hold the pride of it because you know that you are walking your talk like in the deepest of ways. You know, I hadn't thought about it as, as walking my talk, and I'm glad you noticed the grief of it. It's rough, the transition of like losing capacity. Mm, it's got to be. And like, I wish I had infinite energy. And there is nothing I wouldn't do for my relationship. <laughs> so the weird thing about, it, okay, so writing a book is really hard. The origin story of the new book is that writing Come As You Are was so hard that the stress of it erased, obliterated any interest I had in actually having any sex. It was like this deep (laughs) irony that I'm this like sex expert, sex educator, and like my own interest in sex is just on the floor. And so when I was done writing the book, I did what anyone would do. I turned to the peer-reviewed research on how couples sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term. (laughs) And I learned a bunch of stuff that completely flipped my brain inside out in my understanding of what sex and long-term relationships looks like. And now I have written a book about it. And oh yeah, the deep irony that writing this book was also so stressful that I lost any interest in actually having (laughs) any sex with my long-term partner. The good news this time is that when I got done, I had a hundred thousand word manual of how to find my way back to our (laughs) erotic connection that included information about what to do when there's an interabled couple, when one partner has serious limitations. (laughs) Yeah. So even if no one else ever reads the book, if no one else reads the book, it has already made my relationship better. That's beautiful. And I think, I mean, for as much as I, like, as you talk about the challenges you faced in the last 15 months, my heart is, of course, hurting for you and with you and with your husband and all of these new challenges. And at the very same time, your work, I mean, your work is just at this point, it's just so much bigger than you. And so even if you don't give this book what you gave the last book, like, 
we all got it. We all got it. We all know, okay, Emily Nagoski is back. She's got something. We're all going to get it anyways. You know, whether you're on every talk show or one talk show, whether you're, you know what I mean? Like you're like Beyonce at this point, you know, you're too big to fail. <laughs> we got you. We will, we'll float this one. <laughs> Not in any way. Seriously. That- <laughs> seriously. I remember hearing that about Beyonce. Like Beyonce at this point is actually too big to fail. Like she can't write a song that won't succeed because she just has reached that threshold. And that's you at this point. Like your work, you know, your work is bigger than you. And I love that for you because you can stay cozy, stay tucked in, stay near your husband, stay near your self-care. And this book is going to go do its thing, you know, without as much oomph from you as your earlier work needed. That's really therapeutic for me to hear, actually. One of the things I've been working on is uh, my ability to accept all of the support available to me. I have enough help. Yeah. I have great people in my life. I'm like receiving wonderful care. And the more I open myself up to being willing to accept the care that's available, the better I do. So that it's like an area of growth for me as it is for so many people, particularly so many women who were raised <laughs> as girls to behave women. themselves. Yeah, exactly. And I love this framing of like all the people who already have had their lives improved by come as you are, are going to be part of the help of spreading the word about come together. So like, I'm not the only one who's like, and with come as you are, like right in the beginning, it's just like, hi, I'm Emily, you have no idea who I am, but I think I can help you with your sex life. And like, I traveled so much and I did all the things. And maybe this time there's people out there who already know who I am, who will pick up the message and spread it for me so that my limited body doesn't have to do quite so much. Oh, I'm like, this is therapy for me. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Well, it is it is literally the least I can do for all that you have done, you know, in my own personal journey and my professional journey for the people that I'm in community with. So I'm so glad. I'm so glad that feels helpful to you. This is like when I saw this was your next book, I was like, oh, of course, because what you did in Come As You Are was you focused us deeply on our own interior, especially women and women's sexuality, super important. And now you've taken us into a relational space. So what was it? You started to talk a little bit about how it was your own journey of realizing how compromised your sexual desire became under stress. But what really caught your interest in like why? Why this book in this moment? Why are you wanting to help us with our intimate partnerships across the long term? Yeah, it's exactly that question of like, my desire was a problem. When I went to the research, so let's look, for example, at the Optimal Sexual Experiences Research, Peggy Kleinplatz's team in Canada. They interviewed dozens of people who self-identify as having extraordinary sex lives. They have magnificent sex. And when Peggy and her team ask these people what magnificent sex is like, what are the characteristics of it? You know what wasn't on that list? What didn't make the top 10? Desire. Mm-hmm. It wasn't on the list. Wow. So, wha- I, I mean, desire differential is the number one reason why couples seek sex therapy. And yet the people who are having great sex are not thinking about desire. Why? What are they thinking about instead? They are thinking about pleasure. So when Peggy sees a couple where, let's say, partner A says, you know, I'm really sorry it hurts my partner's feelings, but I'd actually be fine if we never had sex again. Assuming this is not a person who's asexual, Peggy will ask the question, okay, so tell me about this sex you do not want. And you can imagine it is not amazing sex. It is, in Peggy's words, dismal and disappointing. And Peggy will say, well, you know, I rather enjoy sex, but if that's the sex I were having, I wouldn't want it either. And so what kind of sex is worth wanting? This is the wild, completely intuitive, yet totally transformative reframing that it is not dysfunctional not to want sex you do not like. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that that is revolutionary, the fact that the vast majority of us need to hear that really speaks to where we are, right? 
it is not problematic to not want sex that you don't like. And so that is why your metric for sexual well-being is not frequency. It's not desire, as you just said. It's not the number of orgasms you had. It is all about pleasure. Yeah. It's whether or not you like the sex you're having. Exactly. And let me say that that was not my situation. I was not a, I'd be happy if we never had sex again. I was really distressed about the struggle I was having to get into a sexy state of mind. So instead of thinking, well, uh, it'd be fine if we never had sex again, I would have gone into therapy and been like, I know we would have such good sex. We would have so much fun. It would be delightful, joyful, connected. If only I could get there. If I could get off the couch and out of my pajamas and into bed, like if I just like I have lost the ability to can, I cannot. And I don't know how to get there because I'm stuck somewhere. I had to figure out where I was stuck and how not just to get unstuck, but how to get from wherever I landed when I was unstuck into a sexy state of mind. And there's two solid chapters about the tool that I used to do that, which mostly has to do with recognizing that I was a very stressed out. I was just like locked in the fear space in my brain. And I know how to deal with stress. I wrote a whole book with my sister about how to deal with stress. Mm -hmm. So And burnout. Right. I complete the stress response cycle. And then what happens? And then I'm somewhere else that's a little bit closer to the lust state of mind. So how do I get all the way to lust? And it was when I figured that out, particularly how I do it with this specific partner, that I, I'll be honest, uh, even even with the COVID, it's better than it's ever been. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Can you... Tell us something or a couple of things that your husband, like how did he hold a space for you as you explored and healed and moved bit by bit, step by step in your journey? Like are there things that you feel like he said or did that were particularly helpful and supportive along the way for you? Oh gosh, he was, I mean, he just nailed it every time. I, confident hair flip. I have a spectacular <laughs> relationship. I'm, I want to say that I'm just really so lucky to have the partner that I have, but I had 15 years of therapy before I met him. So yeah, I earned him. <laughs> so one of the early examples of what would happen is I'd try to follow my own advice. My own advice is like pursue responsive desire. You set a time, you take off your clothes, you put your body in the bed, you let your skin touch your partner's skin, and your body's going to wake up and go, oh, right, I really like this. We want this. I really, we like this. I like this person. This is good. And I would take off my clothes. I would put my body in the bed. I would let my skin touch my partner's skin, and I would just cry and then fall asleep, which mm. there are some partners who would express disappointment or frustration about how like they had an expectation, not a single peep, just compassion. Because he knew that I wanted him, that I'm attracted to him, that I love him. Everything's in place except for like my body is just stuck someplace. And being close to him helped me to get unstuck, but there is no direct path from like releasing stress from your body into a sexy state of mind. Well, for some people there might be, but there is not for me. Do you think what you were doing when you would get in the bed, take off your clothes, put your body next to his body, was that, would you be actually closing the stress response in that moment so that rather than entering a lust space, you were just, you were coming yeah. down, right? You were shifting out of stress. Yeah. Like I get in, I was all stressed mm -hmm. and the proximity mm -hmm. to him, we know that connection is one of the ways it's... <laughs> It's in chapter one of burnout. We know that connection is one of the ways that humans complete their stress response cycle. So I would like have this close physical and emotional contact with my favorite person in the world. And my body would receive that safety and that feeling of being held. And it would just release, <laughs> right. which is in a way <laughs> such a compliment yeah. to my partner and our relationship. But it is it is not what I was going for. <laughs> 
you were going for sexy and you got just... And I got, I got tears and exhaustion yeah. and yeah. sleep. Yeah. But he never once put any pressure on me. He never made me feel guilty or... I criticized myself far more. There was never anything that he said or did that indicated to me that he judged what I was going through. He turned toward all of it with this kindness and generosity and compassion. I have talked to him about like what made him able to do that. And like we kept talking about sex when we weren't having it. This is one of the myths. People think that if you have to talk about sex, there must be a problem. Couples who have great sex talk about it all the time. We kept talking about it and he knew because I said it, like, it's not because there's anything changed about our relationship. It's not because there's anything changed about my attraction to you and my affection for you. It's just my body is in this state. And because he felt genuinely certain that, like, I was attracted to him, that I wanted to be sexual with it, like, I wanted to want sex. Yeah. And I like I just couldn't get there because he knew that for sure. He could he could stay present for my struggle. Your assurance kept him from taking it personally. So it didn't become sort of this injury yes. or wound that felt personal to him. And then he yeah, he was able to stay patient and present. He knew, I mean, you were together. The two of you were together looking at the problem, right? I always say every sexual problem is a couple problem. So you had this couple level problem and you were in it together. Sure, it was happening inside of your body, but it was was relational. And so he could feel connected Mm -hmm. to you even as this route that he was not as available as other times had been. Mm -hmm. And the language I use for this in the book is that it's a third thing. It's not that like there's something wrong with me. It's not that there's something wrong with him. It's not even that there's something wrong with our relationship. It's this third thing that we turn our shared gaze toward with curiosity and affection and appreciation. It's like a hobby. Our sex life is a hobby that we share. Just like if we had a favorite sports team that we followed or a favorite sport that we played together, or like we sang in a choir together, like we schedule time for it. We talk about it all the time. Our favorite things about the last time and like the things we hope will go better next time. When we turn toward our erotic connection, like it's a third thing that holds us together as a couple. It is so much easier to have these not always easy conversations in a way that avoids shaming and blaming and guilt, because it's just there's this problem that exists outside us. How are we going to fix this problem together? Beautiful. Okay, so You know, in order for a couple to even imagine that space of viewing a desire discrepancy or whatever the challenge is as a third thing, they've got to be able to start to challenge and push back against the myths of normal sex, like all of the misperceptions and all the mythology that we take up from culture and media and family and church and all of this. And you give us in this new book a definition of normal sex. And you say, normal sex is any erotic contact among peers, where everyone involved is glad to be there and free to leave with zero unwanted consequences, including emotional consequences, and where no one experiences unwanted pain, either physical or emotional. So can you help us understand this incredible definition of normal sex and why why you want us to really latch onto it and work with it? I actually came up with the definition of normal sex, first of all, because people kept asking me, am I normal? I'm sure you get this all the time. Am I normal? Mm -hmm. I know you're going to say that I'm normal, but let me just explain to you my very specific thing. And then really, am I normal? Just so many times. And I, I was like, what is this normal that people want to be? The scientific definition of normal is not what I think people mean, because scientifically, normal just means within It's plus or minus two standard deviations of the measure of central tendency. People are not asking me, like, am I plus or minus two standard deviations from the measure of central tendency? That's not. Am I normal? (laughs) Well, you are you are similar to 95 percent of the population. That's not actually an answer that helps people. So what is it? But they also don't 
actually just want to be normal because, I mean, people don't read a 100,000 word book about sex so that at the end of a sexual encounter, their partner will turn to them and say, that was really normal sex. So what is what is normal? Normal, I think, is baseline. Like, have I got the bare minimum? And for me, the bare minimum is 100% fully consensual, and it stays fully consensual from A to Z. And no one experiences unwanted pain. That's, for me, the baseline of nothing is going wrong. And I built on that definition for a definition of perfect sex, because people may not want to be told, wow, that was really normal sex. Thanks for that. But they would enjoy being told that was perfect sex. Yeah. And what what is that? So my definition of perfect sex is normal sex, which is everybody's glad to be there, free to leave with no unwanted consequences and no unwanted pain. Plus, everyone turns toward whatever is happening right now in this moment with kindness and compassion and confidence and joy. So mm. if somebody wants an erection and an erection isn't happening, you turn toward whatever's happening in this moment with kindness and compassion and confidence and joy. And you, you could do a bunch of stuff that doesn't involve an erection. Great. You could do a bunch of stuff with a penis that you can do with a non-erect penis that you can't do with an erection. There are many delightful things to do with a non-erect penis. Like they can be a source of enormous pleasure. Instead of worrying that the erection isn't happening, you turn toward whatever's happening right now with kindness, compassion, confidence, and joy. Orgasm. You want orgasm to happen and it's not happening? Turn toward what's happening with kindness and compassion, confidence, and joy. Perfect. So my crying and falling asleep and my husband turning toward that with kindness and compassion, confidence, and joy, perfect sex. Perfect. You give us these really specific definitions of what confidence means and what joy means. Will you tell us that? Yes. When I was teaching at Smith, <laughs> I used the words confidence and joy a lot. And I had been using them for a long time when I used them in the classroom. And a student raised her hand and said, excuse me, Emily, could you please define your terms? And I was like, oh, what, what do I mean by confidence and joy? So I went home and thought about it for a week. And I came back and I was like, okay, confidence comes from knowing what is true about your body, about your culture, about your relationship, about your sexuality, knowing what's true, even if it's not what you were taught is supposed to be true, and even when it's not what you wish were true. Confidence is knowing what is true. Joy is the hard part, because joy is loving what is true about your body, your culture, your relationship, your sexuality, loving what's true, even when it's not what you were taught should be true, and when it's not what you wish were true, loving what's true, even when it's not what you wish were true. Mm. It is such a reachable definition of joy. I think sometimes we get ourselves all twisted up about joy because we we merge it with something that is like giddy or maybe like some of the ideas we have about how, how desire should feel. And so when you give us this mm -hmm. incredibly permissive definition of joy, joy, what if joy is simply loving what's true? It's so, it feels so much more reachable and so much more enjoyable when we're in it because it's, it's just, it's being with what is with gentleness and warmth. It's it's just so beautiful. And it is not easy because a lot of us were raised to, we were given an idea of who we're supposed to be as sexual people. We were taught pretty rigid rules about what our sexuality is supposed to look like and how we're supposed to do it. And to turn toward what's true and love it when it's not what you were taught you are supposed to be, that is a radical act of defiance, daring to believe that this thing that's true about you, who you truly are, is someone worth being instead of whatever that other person, that phantom self that you were taught you were supposed to be. 
The should. Mm -hmm. So much of that comes up around gender, doesn't it? So I want to talk a little bit about what you call the gender mirage. Would you say that the gender mirage is perhaps the most ubiquitous and insidious barrier that lives between us and our full erotic potential? So can you start by telling us what the gender mirage is? So I call it the gender mirage because, so the deal with a mirage is that you see it is absolutely looks like it's there, right? The classic example is seeing water on the horizon in a desert. And so you move toward it because you're dying of thirst and you get there and it's not what was there. You saw it. It looked so real. But when you change your point of view, it vanishes because it doesn't actually exist. It's just an illusion that gets created by the stimulation that is hitting our senses. The gender binary in particular is this mirage. It looks so real. It is so convincing. And we have been taught that it's real from literally before we were born. We were trained into one category or the other, as if it truly is the case that human beings come in one category or the other. And the things that are true of any people in your category must also be true of you. And it's not just that like there's something strange about you if something in your category doesn't match what's true for you. It's that you're a failure. You have a moral obligation to behave according to the rules that you were handed. It feels so real, and we actually do praise and punish each other for the ways that we do or don't conform to this mirage that we have constructed around us. And all it takes to get a mirage to go away is to shift your point of view a little bit you get a little bit closer to it and oh, it poof, it vanishes. So my goal with the chapter specifically about the gender mirage was to bring people close enough to it for it to disappear, which isn't, again, because it has had decades to dig its roots deep into our psyches, I am under no illusion that my one chapter is going to undo... <laughs> All of the nonsense we have ever been trained into believing is true about our sexualities based on something as flimsy as like the shape of our genitals. But I wanted it to be a start because, man, if if we can begin to recognize like what the messages we believe about who we're supposed to be as sexual people and recognize the messages about who we believe our partner is supposed to be partner as a yes. sexual person, yes, like yes. what? expectations are we imposing on this human that have nothing to do with this human and everything to do with these scripts that we have been trained in for so many years? It's not easy. And when you start to clear that stuff out, when you start to like pull it out by the roots and discard it to create space for who you each truly are as sexual people. And again, I recognize that this is effortful and people are probably going to tell you to stop it because you're misbehaving. But man, when you do, <laughs> this is the road to the kind of erotic experiences that transform the universe into rainbows. Oh, you know, I think you do something that is really brave and really important, which is devote an entire chapter to what you call heterosexual type relationships. And that is, yeah. you know, I'm so glad you did because what you say is that, you know, heterosexual couples oftentimes struggle the most with the mirage because heterosexual couples yes. most mimic the mirage, right? They're most aligned. So it feels like, okay, this really, really does feel real. And you get directive. You talk directly to the men and directly to the women. And so can you tell us a little bit about... I guess maybe start with the men. Like, what are some of the things that you feel are most important for men who are partnered with women to keep in mind about their own socialization as well as the ideas they've internalized about the women that they want to be sexual with? Yeah. So for guys, I give two general pieces of advice. One is the advice that my grandmother gave me when she believed I was ready to be in a long-term relationship. She said that if both partners give 50-50, you've got half a relationship. Both people have to give 100%. So when you have that question of like, what do women even want? What does she want? What does she need me to give her so that she can 
give me what I want from the relationship? The answer is your whole self. The answer is all of you, (laughs) including the parts that you were taught from very early on, you were not supposed to give. The parts that you were taught, no, don't exist. The parts like loneliness and sadness and playfulness, joy, a willingness to be vulnerable and authentic, all that stuff that you were probably very explicitly punished for in other domains of your life, those things belong in the relationship. Uh, And then there's the advice that I asked my husband, like, what, what do men need to know? Like, what do you know (laughs) that they need to know? Basically, he said that 80% of it is the non-sexual stuff. You want to improve your sexual connection. 80% of it comes from stuff you do that has nothing to do with your sexual connection. It's being there as a partner, paying attention to what her needs might be. I feel like we are living in a beautiful time of awakening, men recognizing all of the invisible labor that the women in their lives do. And Things really are changing. I I got really worried about the straights while I was writing this book and doing the research. There's a lot of like Facebook groups of they're technically like moms groups, but most of what people are talking about is how much they hate. They use the word hate, how much they hate their husband. And it's heartbreaking to me that people are in this place. So My other piece of advice is that if she is criticizing you, if she is nitpicking, if she's explaining to you things that she feels like you're doing wrong, that's because she still has hope that you can come meet her where she is. She is still fighting to have you connect with her deeply. And for women... (laughs) I spend most of my section for women talking about men, unfortunately, because that is the lopsided nature of the rules that we get taught is that women are responsible for all of the emotional stuff. It's our job to be pretty, happy, calm, generous, and unfailingly attentive to the needs of others. And so we get taught that our partner's needs are our job to meet. And if we want men to open up into our relationship, they're going to have needs. They're going to have feelings about the process of unbrainwashing themselves from the scam that is 21st century masculinity. They're going to have feelings like, who even am I if I'm not that guy? And what do I do with all the grief and anger that I have about the opportunities I missed because I was so busy trying to be that guy? And how do I know for sure that you're going to love the authentic me that I'm discovering underneath that guy? And what he needs is for his partner to show up with him and be present and hold space for those difficult feelings, which sounds like it's just recapitulating the same dynamic of like, women are responsible for meeting all of men's needs, but we have to find the balancing point, right? On the one hand, we could slip right back into the job of like, oh, you have these really hard feelings. Don't worry about it. You don't have to work hard to change. No, I can accommodate you. If it's too hard, I can accommodate you. Like fight against that. Also fight against, you know what? We're doing this like de-binary gender mirage thing so that I don't have to do so much emotional labor. You go do that work by yourself. I don't need another project. That's right. That's right. With a men's group. Right. I hear your call to action. What you're asking for women is not to do it for them, but just like if they are doing it, as they are doing it, as they're deconstructing for themselves, to just to be patient and present, right? You're not asking for, I don't hear you asking for more of, but you know, I imagine that you are asking women to do, to kind of notice what comes up in them when they start to get what they want, right? It's it's easier to sort of want something. And then it is, it's, it is changing the rules and you do... 
you have so many really beautiful questions that you want people to be reflecting on as they work with your book. And one, one of the questions is, like, what do I do when my partner expresses an emotion that I was taught is unacceptable in them? So there is a chance for a woman whose partner is starting to do his work to notice and attend to and be responsible for feelings that may come up in her as he's shifting. Yeah. And this is this is the trick with change in relationships is if both people are changing at the same time, that means you got to go slower. Mm -hmm. Like if two people are wounded, you can walk each other home with your arms around each other, but you're both limping. And that's, yep. You can still get there. But you got to go really slow. Yeah. You got to have patience for the limitations based on the fact that we are all walking around with these wounds in our hearts, in our bodies, in our souls of the emotions we were denied, the love and connection that we did not feel we deserved just because we were trying to be a good girl or a good boy. Yeah. Oh, Emily. I'm so worried about straight people. (laughs) I know. Well, I'm so glad you're saying it. I think you're modeling for me right now. I think there's a way in which I get scared to talk about my worry for the straight people because I'm afraid of leaving out the queer people, right? Like I'm afraid of further marginalizing or further, you know, ignoring or not making space for the experiences of queer folk. But I think you're so spot on that there is a unique and particular challenge that is different from the challenges. It's it's Mm -hmm. not saying that queer couples are challenged less, but there's something unique and difficult for straight couples right now. A hundred percent. Though the research is remarkably consistent that couples that are not heterosexual, lesbian, gay, couples that involve at least one non-binary person, relationships with trans people, all of them, broadly speaking, are happier and have better quality sex. And they have better communication, better conflict management. I mean, the research yeah. is pretty freaking clear. Mm-hmm. Their struggles come more from the outside and straight people's troubles come more from within the relationship. Yeah. I'm really, really glad that you're talking about it and you are inviting me to be less afraid of doing harm by talking about it because it is, um, yeah. it's undeniable. And I think it is what you started with by saying that it's a really cool moment. Like it is a really revolutionary moment that we are looking at invisible labor and these massive inequities in our homes that are just setting the stage for tons of resentment and confusion on men's part. I think men look at their dads and their grandpas and they're like, I don't get it. I do so much more than those men did, which really yes. just is proof of how incredibly far we have, like how much we're trying to reverse something that was so, so, so imbalanced for generations. So Mm -hmm. both can be true. Men can be doing more than they ever saw their fathers do, both in terms of emotional support and boots on the ground, domestic support. And it still is pretty grossly imbalanced. Yeah. Let's just do one listener question before I let you go. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay, so we've got an anonymous listener from Omaha, Nebraska, who uses she, her pronouns. And she says, my husband and I have been married for 11 years. We have two boys, eight and six together. I'm questioning if we should be together. I feel like we rushed into marriage because I was afraid of being alone and missing the opportunity to marry. Note, I was 26. I remember thinking to myself beforehand, we can always get divorced if this doesn't work. I love him as a human. I know he's a good dad. I appreciate how supportive he is, but I'm not physically attracted to him. I generally don't want to be intimate and we don't kiss or touch much. I feel awful because touch is so important for him. Is this something that can be resolved or is physical attraction something that is either there or not? I also wonder if my issues with my body insecurities are being placed on my husband. Where do you want to start? Like what stands out to you? So much. And the thing is, how much is there is what makes it such a great question. (laughs) Let me start by saying that I don't talk about attraction at all in the book, except to say when I talk about aging and how bodies change, because the deal with the whole like till death do you part thing is that your bodies are going to change as you age. If you have the good fortune to achieve old age, your body's going to be really different than it was. And people can still be profoundly attracted to their partner, even when their body is unrecognizable from what it was when they first met. So physical attraction is not 
even really about being attracted to the body. It's about your attraction to the human. So I don't talk about attraction. I talk about trust, which it sounds like they have in the relationship, Mm -hmm. apart from her holding this away from him. I'm assuming they're not having conversations about this. Um, And that barrier, he's going to feel something missing, though he won't know what it is. And the other thing I talk about in relationships is admiration, where your partner comes home and you like when my garage door opens and I know that it's because Rich has come home, I get a little fizzy feeling in my body of like, (laughs) yay, because I feel so lucky to have this person as my partner. I watch him do his work and he 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 reads my email for me because I find email really exhausting in this like brain fog state that I'm in. And like when people are like, your husband is so nice. He's so good at email. I'm like, I know. Oh my gosh. I'm so <laughs> lucky to have him as a partner. You admire him. You admire him. I admire him so deeply. So it sounds like there is a lot of that. Yeah. She admires him as a dad. Yeah. There's a lot there. And absolutely, physical attraction can be co-created through admiration and trust and kindness and intimacy. And that is why my recommendation, you probably could have called this, is therapy. Create a safe space to have this conversation. I absolutely have come to the conclusion that no good relationship needs to end because the sex is not going the way people want it to go. Right. Because if the biggest barrier here is that she doesn't know how to start to talk about what's happening inside of her, as you're saying, he's feeling something, he just doesn't know what it is. And so then he's got his stories, his fears, his hypotheses going. And so in the risk here, as is often the case, is that just the space, the space continues to grow and they feel further and further apart and she feels him pulling away and then she pulls away. And what you're saying here is there's nothing that you're hearing here is raising huge red flags or alarm bells in your mind around this relationship. But this relationship needs to have a different pathway to talk talk about what's feeling true for her right now. And I get why people are so reluctant to have these conversations. She clearly cares about him enough not to want to hurt his feelings by saying something like, I don't find you attractive. Like, ouch, we are all very tender around sexuality. We do not want to hurt each other. We are all like so ready to feel criticized at the least brush in the direction of the sex isn't going the way that I want it to, which is why therapy, like creating a safe space, it might actually help for her to do individual therapy first to work through like, what is the language I can bring? This is, this is how I did it with my partner. I had individual therapy first so I could figure out what language to bring to my partner to make sure he knows it's not him. There's a thing in me. And maybe she feels like it is him. Here is a thing I don't say out loud very often. I too was thinking, we can always get a divorce Mm -hmm. (laughs) when we got married. And when we were struggling at the most, part of me was like, this is very hard work. We could just get a divorce instead. But we worked through it with the help of my therapist. And like, I cannot imagine my life without him now. Mm, Yeah. I also really think that your book is a resource for the two of them. I want our listener in Nebraska to just, I can just see her sitting down with your book and starting to work with these questions and her partner looking at the book because there's, you know, an entire world happening inside of him as well, Mm -hmm. what he's longing for, what he's afraid Mm -hmm. to say. And so, you know, we want them to be thinking about like, what are the contexts that help her brain most easily experience pleasure? How do the two of them create context? I mean, you are, yes, you are so devoted to helping us look at the context that invite pleasure, that reduce the barriers to pleasure. And so this is work that they could do together around just playing creatively with the context and a six and eight year old boys. I mean, my goodness, 
kids are not famous for being like, let's back up so that mom and dad have some space and time for themselves. So how can <laughs> the two of them together, you know, kind of claim spaces and, and moments that are really for them to look at each other and be like, oh, yeah, I know you. I remember you. I like you. And it sounds like probably both of them are so lonely in the relationship. And there is a danger in loneliness. So what the brain research has shown us is that when people are lonely, uh, their brains are more likely to interpret someone approaching them for social connection as a threat, which just increases their sense of isolation. So the more they let their individual loneliness grow in the relationship, the more their bodies may feel that if my partner approaches me, it's dangerous, that there is something unsafe about that approach which is, that's therapy. <laughs> have have an yeah. expert present to help you find your way to each other. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, Emily, what a pleasure for me to get to spend this time with you. So thank you to our listener in Omaha, Nebraska. And thank you, Emily, for just being here. Thank you, Rich, for everything that you do for <laughs> and with Emily so that we all <laughs> get to benefit from her. He's currently sitting in a room with all of the pets so that they don't make noise. Even now, he is participating. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So if there is, you know, a listener who has not heard of you, where can people go to start to learn? Learn more about all of your good work. The website is just emilynagoski.com. It's my name. E. Nagoski is my Instagram. Uh, and I am actually doing a physical book tour, traveling to many different cities to have conversations about sex and long-term relationships. So uh, I may be coming to somewhere near you and I, I hope people will come out and leave their homes and put on real clothes and spend time Ooh. talking about sexual pleasure. It's my favorite thing to do. Okay. Well, we will have links for all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much fun. Thank you to Dr. Emily Nagoski for joining me here on Reimagining Love. And I also want to offer my deepest gratitude to our brave listener for submitting this vulnerable question. I hope that our responses gave you and the many other listeners who surely relate to your question, lots of useful tools and information to ponder. Emily's new book, Come Together, is out now. I can't wait to see the impact this book is going to have. If you're curious about fostering lasting sexual connections, you can find links to the book and Emily's book tour in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd be so appreciative if you left us a review on whatever platform you listen on. Until next time, be well. Reimagining Love is produced and edited by Emily Reeves. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love. <laughs>